Well, it's been a while since I've touched on Flat Earth, but one of my subscribers informed me that Anthony Riley tried to do a thing with calculations based on his relative density disequilibrium idea. For the uninitiated, the idea is that it is the density of an object compared to its medium that determines whether an object floats or sinks, and gravity is not a thing. As some of you may remember, I presented a formulation of the whole relative density disequilibrium nonsense, which is the closest to making physical sense and allowed me to make numerous predictions, none of which, of course, hold up to experimentation. But that is because the core idea is complete nonsense. Now, Sloppy Warrior responded with the usual bucket of ignorance and a complete lack of understanding, but he was right about one thing. And that is that I didn't use his formulation. According to him, this is a straw man, but of course that is also incorrect. It was the opposite of a straw man, something called a steel man, where one constructs the strongest possible version of the argument before tearing it apart. But okay, there was a live stream a while ago, and our comatose combatant attempted to do some maths. And from this, we can gain a glimpse of the formulation that he has in mind. In my previous video on this subject, I postulated that in the absence of gravity, the absolute value of the difference between the density of an object and a medium is some sort of potential. The reason for this is that I could then take this scalar quantity, find the gradient, and get a force using the same relationship between any other potential and its associated force. The conclusions were rather fun. During his live stream, our groggy gorilla informs us that it is the ratio between the object's density and the medium's density that is important. And it doesn't matter which way round as long as you remain consistent. Of course, it does matter what way around it is, but here we are just going to explore what's happening. So first, we start with the density of an object divided by the density of the medium. Now, apparently, if this results in a negative number, then the object sinks. If it is positive, it floats. Of course, the most obvious problem here is that density is always positive, and a ratio between the two numbers cannot yield a negative number. But then the distance from the number one gives you the magnitude of the force, or possibly acceleration. We'll just say that it is an acceleration, and it is proportional to this ratio. But now let's write something which can actually give you a different sign and magnitude at the same time. This takes the object's density and divides it by the medium's density, and then subtracts 1. This is a dimensionless quantity and still a scalar, but we are going to ignore that for now. We are going to define some quantity b, so we can say that b is equal to to the object's density over the medium's density minus 1, and we can then say that a is proportional to b, where b is equal to this quantity. And this will allow us to do some work before having to worry about coefficients and stuff, because Anthony doesn't like them. We now take some simple test cases. We wonder what would happen if we have an object's mass greater than the medium's mass. Well, in this case, the ratio is greater than 1, and therefore b is greater than 0. When we consider experiments, we know that in this case we would observe the object accelerating downwards. So, to stay in keeping with convention, we will stick in a minus sign. When the two are equal, b is equal to zero, which makes sense. There is no acceleration and the object just hovers. When the object is less dense, after we have put that minus sign in there, we can see that b is positive, so the acceleration is upwards. So that's our first test, and it seems to work with what we know from observations. Next is a process called finding the limits. In philosophy, this is also referred to as reductio ad absurdum. And this is where you push the formulation or the idea to extremes to see if it holds there. First, I will see what happens when the object's density is zero. Of course, this is a silly statement, but we could instead say the limit where the object's density approaches zero. And we find that b approaches 1. Nothing too concerning at this point. It doesn't quite check out, but OK. But then we check what happens when the medium's density approaches 0. And this doesn't work very well. And we can just say that for a medium's density much smaller than the object's density, this equation blows up. 
You can even plug in some numbers. Let's say that our object's density is 1000 kilogram per cubic meter and our medium's density is 1 kilogram per cubic meter. It will accelerate down at some rate. But then we halve the medium's density by evacuating the chamber a bit and the medium's density is now 0.5 kilogram per meters cubed. According to this formulation, this should double the downward acceleration. If we now evacuate a chamber a bit more to something that vaguely resembles a vacuum, we have a density of say 10 to the minus 4 kilogram per meter cubed, then the acceleration should be 10,000 times larger. So this clearly doesn't work. But remember that our fatigued fighter said that it doesn't matter what way around the ratio is. Well, it does, and we will see what happens if we swap it over. So now we have this expression where A is proportional to B, and B is equal to the ratio of the medium's density over the object's density minus 1. And we find that in our test cases, when the object's mass is greater than the medium's mass, B is negative, and we don't need to add that minus sign anymore. When the medium's density is greater than the object's density, B is positive, and stuff floats. So this holds with observations. We also have a linear relationship between the medium's density and B. And this means that if the medium's density approaches zero, it approaches a constant value. And we can work with this. When the medium's density is zero, B is equal to minus one. And we can compare to experiment and we find that when the medium's density is zero, the downward acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared. So now we have more information and we can possibly get rid of the proportionality and turn it into an equality by multiplying B by 9.81 meters per second squared. And we will call this factor the Unis factor. And we will denote this with a squiggly U. So we get this expression. Now we don't really know anything about this Unis factor. We, we just know that this scales the acceleration of the object in a vacuum so it has the correct magnitude and dimensions. We could also call it the dropativity of free space. Why not? It could be a universal constant. It could be something specific to our conditions, but it definitely has to be there. So now we have an expression which actually appears to hold up to experimentation. So let's determine the force. As you know, force is defined as the product of the mass of the object and the acceleration. We expand the brackets, but we know that the object's mass can also be expressed as the product of density and volume. And we cancel the object's density on the first term. And this works. This is an expression that will hold up to experimentation. I've already done the experiment and show that it does. This is because this is the equation for the forces acting on a submerged object. We have two terms. One is the upward force, which is proportional to the medium's density, the object's volume, and this unis factor. The second is a downward force, which is proportional to the mass of the object and this unis factor. Now, this presents a problem for Anthony Riley. Even though this shows that the upward force is dependent on the medium's density, it is also dependent on the object's volume and this unis factor. More problematic for his assertion is that there exists a downward force which is completely independent of the medium's density. Of course, Anthony is going to say that I cheated by introducing that unis factor and that you can't do that. Well, I can, but to humor him, we can just take it out and revert back to proportionality rather than an equality. The downward force is still not proportional to the medium's density. Funny how linear combinations work. But remember why that unis factor was introduced. This was so that we can set the result of this expression to be consistent with experiments. Because if you remove it, the acceleration of the object when in a vacuum should be minus one. Just minus one, no, no dimensions, no direction, just minus one. But with that factor, the formulation works. So we have figured out a formulation for Anthony Riley's relative density disequilibrium and developed an equation that accurately describes reality. However, the formulation does not support Anthony's claims and you cannot avoid that pesky little constant that had to go in there for the equation to make sense and agree with experimental results. So here you go, Anthony. The next step for you on your voyage of discovery is figuring out what that little constant means and where it comes from.
good luck. But that was it for today. It's been a while since I've done any flat earth stuff. It was a short one, but I enjoyed it as it was rather surprising. But I want to say thank you to my patrons, specifically my newest patron, William Foley. But thank you all for watching and you will see me soon.